All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, March 1st, uh, 2021 edition of the Polyploid webinar. Uh, um, we have uh, two great speakers talking about uh, polyploidy in, in both plants and animals. Uh, up first today is uh, Kevin Bird. Uh, Kevin is a PhD candidate in the horticultural depart horticulture department and EEB program at Michigan State University with Pat Edger uh, and Bob Van Buren. He is interested in genome evolution and subgenome dominance and uses natural and resynthesized polyploids to tackle these subjects. Uh, today, Kevin's going to tell us about his uh, recent work in uh, Brassica napis on replaying the evolutionary tape and in synthetic uh, uh, Brassica napis polyploids and how deterministic is subgenome, subgenome dominance. Uh, and with that, I'll let Kevin take it away. Great. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, really excited to be here uh, and sharing some of this work that uh, was just recently published uh, for my dissertation. Um, so. I, there's a lot of interest, uh, probably a lot of varied reasons why people are interested in polyploidy, and there's not uh, a whole lot that needs to go into explaining that to this group, but the thing that got me the most interested in polyploidy uh, is its relation to novelty and the generation and potential to uh, create novel traits and, and kind of cross uh, valleys in the fitness landscape. And there's a lot of things that happen with genome mergers. There's changes in gene dosage, there's changes in regulatory mechanisms, there's genetic changes from homeologous recombination, there's epigenetic changes. Uh, and this, all of these things being matched together in a single nucleus when, when uh, allopolyploidy occurs is probably why there's both long-term um, richness and novelty from polyploidy, but also short-term issues. And so, one of uh, the very recent kind of findings in polyploid genomics is about subgenome dominance. And so if we think about the two genomes coming together in a single nucleus, uh, there's some issues that can arise from that. There can be conflict between the two subgenomes where dominance occurs. So there can be ways to sort of navigate this merger. Uh, and so, you know, when you think about it, if there's two subgenomes uh, in the strawberry plant that are kind of uh, trying to work together, there can be uh, dominance of either one of the parents. So the, the expression, especially in neopolyploids, will be biased towards one parental subgenome over the other. Or there can be sort of an even 50-50 split of contribution to the transcriptome, or there can be sort of the spatio-temporal um, partitioning. So maybe um, different tissue types are reliant more on one subgenome parent than the other, or in different kind of phases of the development, there will be one that will take over. And I found this kind of way of trying to navigate very complex, um, a very complex challenge of uh, two evolutionary distinct genomes in a single nucleus to be very interesting. And um, there is some models that have developed in trying to understand this. Probably one of the more um, common ones right now is, is relating expression bias and homeologs to differences in genomic features. Most, most often, um, the density of TEs that are flanking genes uh, and the, the distance to. So when we think about that, um, there's uh, CHH methylation is a methylation context that's very particular to plants. It's, it's only found in plants. And its, its role is to silence TEs to stop them from um, transposing. But uh, work found that uh, CHH methylation and TEs can spill over and affect neighboring genes. And so this entire model is based off of if you have differences in TE density near genes, there will be differences in the amount of methylation that may spill over and silence those genes compared to other ones. And so, you know, in this example, there's three parents, one, two, and three, and one and two have roughly equal distance and density of TEs flanking them. And so there will be unbiased expression, but parent three compared to two has more TEs closer to the gene and just TEs closer in general. And so there will be higher parent two expression because this, the silencing mechanism for the transposable elements will reduce the expression of, of the homeologous gene. And so this entire idea then is that homeologous expression bias is just a function of these differing TE densities and flanking genes. And so if that's the case, I was wondering, and, and the question that sort of generated this study is if you were to replay the evolutionary tape as, as Stephen Gould gave the metaphor once, uh, what would it look like with subgeome dominance? So based off of this model of differing TE densities, uh, it, it is proposed, or you would think it may be very deterministic, that the same parents crossing multiple times uh, will lead the same subgeome dominance result. 
but it's possible that through some sort of stochastic process or through different evolutionary demands that maybe there could be more variety in the outcome of subgenome dominance from the same parental crosses. And while there are several good examples of um, repeated origins of polyploids that are known in the wild, uh, the resources, the genomic resources, aren't as robust as some uh, other systems where it's either unclear if there's a single or multiple origins or signs point toward a single origin. So instead, uh, I used resynthesized Braskinapis polyploids that have been generated um, by, by people um, several decades ago at the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, that uh, recapitulate the origins of Brasca napis. They take uh, uh, as a maternal Brasca laracea, which we know from all the tasty cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and kohlrabi and kale, and cross that with uh, Brasca rapa, which more uh, people probably still recognize from Chinese cabbage and pak choy and turnip, and cross them together. Um, these lines were both parents were doubled haploid. So there were, there's no background genetic variation between these individuals. It was the same genotypes and genetically identical at the start uh, uh, from being produced. They were self-fertilized over 10 generations. Um, and so what this gives is, is the very beginnings of uh, an allopolyploidy event and, and gives a really powerful system to uh, investigate what happens directly after uh, genome duplication. Uh, so, you know, these started isogenic, there's lots of phenotypic variation between the lines, which is surprising, and, and there's also spontaneous phenotypic changes within the lines. So this is an example of one genotype starting from uh, the first generation to uh, the 11th generation, and you see right around generation six, uh, it spontaneously generates a, a dwarf mutation. So there's lots of interesting things going on within these lines. Um, previous work has implicated um, homeologous recombination is generating a lot of this phenotypic novelty, but um, they haven't been investigated with sort of next generation sequencing technologies. And so this was a very exciting opportunity. And uh, these lines were interrogated with whole genome resequencing, RNA-seq, and whole genome bisulfite sequencing to look at uh, the transcriptomic changes, the methylome changes. And um, with all these homeologous recombination events happening, in these polyploids, it's very difficult to get an apples to apples comparison because if you're comparing a gene that actually has multiple copies of one parent, like a three to one ratio instead of two to two, you're going to not only have changes in the parental transcriptomes, but dosage changes from this recombination event. So in this project, the whole genome resequencing was so that I could establish that the gene pairs I was looking at were uh, in a balanced ratio where there are two copies from both parents and there wasn't any re uh, shuffling from homeolus recombination that could be a contributing bias. Uh, this is gonna be kind of the first result looking at homeology expression bias and explaining just how to understand this graph. This is a distribution of the log two fold change between homeologs. On the right are genes that are significantly biased toward the uh, maternal Brascolaracea subgenome, the BNC. Uh, and this was a log two fold change cutoff of um, uh, three, three, three and a half uh, was what I chose just to make sure that I was getting very strongly biased homeologs. And if I dropped it to two, which some people have done, the results are basically the same, but without replicates and things, I was trying to be certain uh, that I was, I was seeing some real strong uh, transcriptome bias. And then on the left, the same thing, it's looking at uh, BNA bias pairs toward the paternal Brasca rapa subgenome. Uh, so this is just one individual at the first generation, uh, but we have way more that we can look at here. So we can look at a single individual through time, starting with an in silica parent, where um, I just take the transcriptomes, the two parental genomes, and sort of combine them into a, an in silica um, allopolyploid genome and, and see what it looks like. Uh, and so um, there's kind of a lot going on here, but the three big takeaways of what I found was that uh, in all individuals and through all time points, there were significantly more uh, C subgenome biased gene pairs than A subgenome biased gene pairs. So this is pretty strong evidence of uh, bias toward the C subgenome and bias that is consistent uh, and, and sort of uh, replicable through these different um, independent origins. Uh, in many of the lines, there was an increasing uh, proportion of BNC bias subgenomes through time if you compared the ratio between BNA and BNC biased. 
And then really interesting is that the same bias was found in the parents before any of the contributions from polyploidy would be um, acting on homeologic expression. So um, this is interesting and surprising uh, and, and uh, also is pretty good evidence that there is something um, related to the parents themselves that's driving a lot of this. Um, not everything, but a substantial fraction of, of subgenome dominance and homeolic expression bias seems to be related to parental features that are then recapitulated through these, these offspring. Um, after identifying this, my next question was, um, are these the same genes that are being dominantly expressed across lines and through time? Or is there variation between what genes are being dominantly expressed? And so this plot uh, has a lot going on again, but there's one uh, very kind of simple thing, which is this line right here are genes that are uh, dominantly expressed in the parents and all six lines. So this is always the same genes, always expressed the same way. Um, and then as we move on, this is uh, only dominantly expressed in the parents, only dominantly expressed in all six lines. And then everything from here over is just a mishmash of um, the different combinations of, of parent and uh, lines. But uh, overwhelmingly, I think from here, you can see that the majority of, of biased gene pairs, uh, especially for the for B and C biased gene pairs, are biased the exact same way in all lines in all generations. So the first generation, the second generation, the pattern still stands. Um, there's slightly more happening on the right side of, of here. So there's some changes as we go through time of gene pairs that are losing a biased uh, relationship. And so they're, they're having more variability. And then the 10th generation, still overwhelmingly uh, dominant the same way, the same genes in all lines in the parent, uh, although there's starting to be more variability among the lines. So this is, I would say, largely uh, a, a kind of fixed aspect of the parental genomes, but clearly um, there's more going on than just uh, a fixed um, kind of co contributor as variation sort of increases through time. Uh, finally, now that I had a list of genes that appeared to be repeatedly uh, dominantly expressed uh, in all lines uh, and generally through time, I wanted to look at those both in a network context to see what they may be uh, doing within uh, a protein-protein interaction network, and also to look for enrichment in biological processes and locations and, um, and things like that. So, uh, this is just uh, an absolute hairball, but there's some in, some short things that are interesting. So um, for B and C bias genes, there was enrichment for um, uh, like organonitrogen, amine biosynthesis, peptide bi uh, metabolism, a lot of kind of primary metabolism, and then also uh, and most interesting is enrichment for cellular cellular localizations like the cytoplasm, the plastid, the mitochondria. So um, Bearing in mind that the B and C parent uh, was the maternal parent, seeing this enrichment in um, uh, in um, plastids and in mitochondria is looking like there may be some sort of cytonuclear interactions that may be driving some of this bias of kind of maintaining the proper relationships between the organelles and the nuclear genome. And so there's this importance in uh, maintaining C subgenome dominance. Uh, kind of helping support this, if we look at the BNA subgenome network, um, these are um, BNA biased genes put it, it, it in the Arabidopsis protein-protein interaction network with Arabidopsis homologs. There's no enrichment for any biological processes or locations and very weak enrichment for things like connectivity and centrality. And so these genes don't seem to have a, um, they're not enriched for any biological processes. They don't seem to be doing anything consistent or concerted compared to random networks and compared to the genome-wide average. Um, next, I started looking at um, methylation, trying to understand what the regulation and the methylation of these genes looked like. So um, very interesting, contrary to what we expected off of this model of TE dominance, the, this, the dominant subgenome, the C um, subgenome, was more highly methylated than the A subgenome. Uh, which and this is in the CHH methylation context. So this is what we think would be lower uh, or leading to spillover that would silence genes. We saw the exact opposite effect um, because we didn't have reference genomes for both parents, only one of the parents. It is not easy to know if 
what the TE landscape looks like flanking these genes. And so there could be, um, despite these methylation patterns, the genes are further away from, or the TEs are further away from the genes in the C subgenome, the A subgenome, we don't really know. Uh, but so that's a general pattern. Um, there was higher methylation in the, in the C subgenome. Um, and then uh, methylation increases over time, which has been observed before. So between the first and the fifth generation, there's this increase in CHH methylation. And then uh, the most interesting is that at the 10th generation, the methylation levels, all of them, or basically all of them exceed parental methylation levels, which uh, as far as I know, uh, I haven't seen uh, many, if any, papers reporting that. So there's some interesting transgressive uh, methylation that's happening and hypermethylation that is um, exceeding what, what exists in the parents for whatever reason. Um, it's very hard to pin down kind of causal mechanisms of methylation data, but this is still very interesting. Um, and these were these patterns were were observed in pretty much every line. This is just showing one of the lines, but they all look roughly the same way. Um, finally, I was interested in looking at methylation specifically in biased gene pairs. So this is a little hard to wrap wrap your head around, but uh, this is the BNC subgenome, so the copy that's on the BNC subgenome, and this is the copy that's on the BNA subgenome, and the colors represent biased relationships. So these are um, in red, C-biased gene pairs and the copy that's on the C subgenome. And here in blue is A-biased uh, pairs on the A subgenome. The real key thing here is that there is a very, uh, I don't know if I can get that out of here. Down here, if you can see that, I'm not sure if you can. Um, there we go. Um, there is a, a sizable <laughs> gap between um, the transcription start site and the CG methylation context, which is what we're looking at here, compared to A bias genes on the, or C bias genes on the C subgenome and A bias genes. Um, this is a pattern that's typically associated with higher expression, is having reduced methylation at the transcription start site. Um, and then additionally, for the CG, CHG, and CHH context, the other two contexts of methylation, there is a reduction in methylation in the gene body for um, C bias genes on the C subgenome. And again, all of these patterns are associated with higher gene expression, um, whether causally or in a corridor of the nature. So um, this is not the pattern that we expect to see in methylation, but all of them point toward explaining or being consistent with the expression patterns we see, which may point toward some sort of novel mechanism or something that may, that may be inconsistent with this TE density model, but is still driving expression differences and we just haven't figured out exactly what's going on. So to, you know, to get back to this, this original question of is subgenome dominance deterministic or variable, at the expression of the meth methylation level, it seems to be mostly deterministic, mostly playing out the same way. Um, you know, uh, the specific number is 70% of genes were, were biased expressed in the exact same way in all lines in the parent. Uh, so 30% sizable, but the, the overwhelming pattern is, is sort of being constricted and restrained to, to act the same way across these or the, the independent origins. Um, I have a little bit of time left and this, this work is uh, a little about a year old now. So there's uh, some, some a sneak peek of uh, some other things that I've been working on with the same data set. So um, in addition to um, being able to identify two to two balanced homeologs, there's also an opportunity to look at homeology recombination with whole genome resequencing data. So that's been looked at in, in the same population uh, about 10 years ago now um, using fish. And so you can see there's a lot of variability in um, chromosome copy number. Here, there's three copies of the A chromosome five and two copies of, of um, the C, C chromosome five, one to three, zero and four. So it's been completely deleted and compensated by the other subgenome. Two and zero, uh, actually that's, um, there's not a, 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 uh, a um, homologous chromosome for uh, A10. Uh, but so uh, the karyotype of these lines is very variable and uh, is very dynamic. And now uh, there's a very cool opportunity to just look at what uh, mapping reads does. So here we're looking at the A chromosome and we're mapping reads to the, to the A chromosome and we see 50% of reads mapping to the A chromosome 
50% mapping to the C chromosomes. This matches the two to two balance that we see with the fish data. And then if we go to one where we have a verified zero to four, uh, we can see 0% of reads in the later generations mapping toward, or roughly 0% mapping toward the A chromosome uh, and nearly 100% mapping to the C chromosome in the later generations. Um, the really interesting thing is that we have improved resolution using this genome resequencing and we can see things like um, at the very tip, there is actually a complete replacement of uh, the C chromosome tip with the A chromosome. So even though most of the A chromosome is gone, some of it must have recombined onto the C subgenome and is present 100%. So it's, it's been a complete replacement of those two. Or um, on, in other parts, there's this sort of uh, one to three relationship that is, is changing. And so there's been this recombination of these homologous chromosomes that isn't observable in fish, but we can pick up with whole, whole genome resequencing. So you may lose physically the chromosome, but you maintain some of those regions based off of the, the recombination that's been occurring prior to that. Uh, and also we can look at how consistent homeologous exchanges are. So these are our gene dosage changes and how shared they are. This is just in the fifth generation. And here, uh, contrary to what we saw with uh, the expression data, it's, it's predominated by, by line-specific homeologous recombination events and line-specific dosage uh, changes. Uh, and hardly a uh, very small amount is shared among all the lines. I can't quite find it. Um, not there. It's, I, it's, it's somewhere in the, in the middle here. It's just not, it's not the most predominant pattern. Oh, right here. Um, so far less than is in these line specific ways. Um, despite that though, there's lots of variability between these lines, but there are some regions that look to be homeologous exchange hotspots. And so uh, these are uh, events that are consistently recombination events and the darkness of the color represents how many lines it is biased towards one parent over the other. So there's somewhere a few lines show a C replacement in this region. And then all lines show it at the, at the tip. These are sort of split 50-50. But the most important thing is, is these asterisks, which represent natural homeolus recombination events that have been identified in cultivated Braska napis. So just with six lines, I've been able to find hotspots that reflect other homeolus exchange regions in natural napis. So because of their location, because of collinearity between these chromosomes, they're, they're hotspots, they're repeated locations of, of homeolus recombination. Um, so even though there's all this variability, there are still some regions that are repeatedly involved in this process. Um, and this last slide is the first, the first time I showed you this graph, it was only constricting it to genes that were in two to two dosage in all lines. When I get rid of that and I allow some genes to be present in all lines and some to not be present in all lines, we start seeing more variability and an increased number of genes with changed dosage bias. And it's not because uh, the genes are actually more expressed, it's because the dosage on the chromosomes has shifted. And so there's this, basically what's happening, or what I would argue is sort of the source of phenotypic variation is homeous combination is changing fixed expression biases to shift the dosage patterns. And so the expression of the genes is basically the same, but you're shuffling them to different combinations of two to two and one to three and three to one. And that's where you start getting these major changes in expression and in gene dosage that can lead to phenotypic novelty. Uh, and this is just the same in the fifth generation uh, and the 10th generation. Now we're starting to see a lot of line specific um, dosage expression patterns of genes that are only found in a single line. And that's because recombination is changing what genes are present and which aren't uh, and, and shifting this dosage. Um, so, you know, when looking at phenotypic variation in these recent decized lines, it's not constrained because gene expression and methylation are largely deterministic. There is these stochastic aspects like homeologous recombination that can shuffle around these fixed differences and produce novel dosage and novel, novel expression levels and can lead to things like that dwarf phenotype that was observed in the sixth generation of that one line. Um, so I think I've hit time pretty well. And I'd like to uh, thank my advisors and my collaborators uh, at Michigan State and you know, around the world uh, with, with Jiang. 
um, and the funding that helped kind of get this research going, both for me as a student and also for the startup funds to kind of sequence these lines as, as sort of a pilot project. And uh, I'll open it up to questions now. All right, well, well thank you, Kevin, for a great talk. Um, as always, uh, feel free to post your questions there in the chat box on the side. And um, uh, and we'll have folks uh, go ahead and ask those on audio and video as well once they're in there. All right, Justin Conover, come on up. <laughs> yeah, good question. Hey, so, hey, Kevin, uh, I think I'm not sure my video is loading. There it is. Um, I, I'm wondering if you happen to do any spike in controls for the total transcriptome size throughout the generations, because since yeah. you see a global increase in methylation, that could be selection for smaller transcriptome size overall. I'm wondering if you happen to include that. Yeah, we didn't include spike ins for this. And that's something that that would be really like powerful. Like you said, there may be changes to the total transcriptome happening through time. Um, it's really hard to know. We're as close to apples to apples as you can be with these kind of isogenic lines. But yeah, there's lots of other things that could happen to to change the transcriptome itself that we can't, we don't have that um, that control for to to look at absolute changes. Gotcha. Thank you. I guess if you if you replay the tape on this experiment, pardon the pun, um, that would be really cool to see if there's um, because I don't think many people have looked at transcriptome size through generations of polyploidy. So yeah, that would really be, exciting that'd to be see. extremely interesting. Yeah, really exciting to see the results that you have. Nice work. All right. Hey, next up is Misha. Hi, Kevin. Uh, great talk. Thanks for, for sharing. So I'm really intrigued by some of the like uh, sneak peek data that you are sharing. Um, so have you looked to see if like these hotspot areas where um, the homeologous recombination tends to happen? I guess I have sort of a two part question. One that I, I typed in the chat is if you've looked at like the sequence similarity between the, the subgenomes at those areas. And then also are those spots um, just in general recombination hotspots in the parents? Yeah. Um... Good question. Um, for the first one, I haven't looked at like this, the kind of sub chromosomal regions, but uh, it is sort of, um, I guess it is known that chromosome pairs one and two in Brassica rapa and Oleracea are, they're almost completely syntenic. Um, and so the, the, the structural conservation is there. And that's why those tend to have the most homeologous recombination events because it, it, it's easiest for that crossing over to occur. Um, I don't know if there's anything different at the kind of sub-regional level happening. And I also haven't looked at uh, like recombination maps to see if, if there's more recombination happening in those regions. I would expect that there is because they're sort of the tips of these highly collinear chromosomes. Um, there also may be some um, genes in those regions that are more amenable to dosage changes because there's... Um, you know, all the um, category restrictions of dosage changes where these, these um, like transcription factors are sometimes uh, more dosage resistant uh, and like secondary metabolites or, or sort of like periphery network genes are more amenable to dosage changes. So there, there's probably a combination of like recombination differences and functional uh, like composition differences. Yeah, cool. Thanks so much. All right, yeah, David uh, Kopetsky with their last uh, last question before we move on to Trevor's talk. Hello, um, it was just amazing talk. Uh, I, I just wonder how much the subgenome dominance uh, at this homologous expression bias level uh, is biased by this homologous recombination. Uh, if you would recall, if you would recalculate uh, the, the numbers of the genes which are uh, either biased towards A or C genome, how much this uh, will happen if you will take in account uh, the number of copies from both alleles? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think, I don't remember ever making those, um, um, making those histogram plots without accounting for, for two to two balance. But I think those, those, um, upsetter plots that I showed showing the number of genes that are shared expression relationships or dominance direction across multiple lines 
shows that there is quite a bit of um, um, changes that that homeologs recombination introduces, um, shuffling around these homeologs and and can lead to differences in in, in the number of biased gene pairs. So I don't I don't think I ever looked exactly at how much it's biased by homeologs recombination, but um, based off of those upsetter plots, I think it's you, it would probably be observable. You could you could notice that there's uh, even more if you don't control for for um, for dosage imbalance. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, well thank you, Kevin. And uh, we see yeah, Chris has left us with a comment, more than a question, uh, there in the box <laughs> to let us know these were plant materials were made when dinosaurs roamed the earth uh, back when Chris was a. PhD student or postdoc. So <laughs> there we go. All right. Well, with that, we'll uh, switch over to uh, Krebber. And I'll just say for anybody who has any other questions that, that pops in their head about Kevin's talk, uh, feel free to save those to the end. We'll have some time at the end to revisit uh, any, any uh, outstanding uh, things that you'd like to know about. Uh, with that, I'll let uh, Trevor go ahead and uh, take over the screen and uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, and our next speaker is Dr. Uh, uh, Trevor uh, Krabenhoff, uh, who is uh, Trevor is a studies fish ecology and evolution, uh, and recently he's been studying genome evolution in fishes in light of whole genome duplication. Uh, he has a master's from the University of South Carolina, a PhD from the University of New Mexico, and did postdocs at the University of New Mexico, Texas A&M, and Wayne State University. Uh, he's currently an assistant professor of biological sciences at the University at Buffalo, and as he notes uh, in his email to me, a student of polyploidy. Uh, and so it's really wonderful to, have, to welcome him to the group today to, to talk to us uh, about his work. Uh, today he's going to tell us about his work on the conservation of karyotype and subgenome structure over deep time in allopolyploid fish. With that, I'll let uh, Trevor take it away. Thanks, Mike, for that introduction. And a uh, uh, great talk, Kevin. I really enjoyed that uh, previous talk. Um, thank you all for coming and uh, to Mike for uh, setting this webinar series up. I think most of us would agree it's been probably some of the best content on YouTube the last uh, several months, so, so thanks for that. Um, part of my motivation for giving this talk today was this um, classic paper by H.J. Mueller uh, that most of you are probably familiar with, why polyploidy is rarer in animals than uh, in plants in the polyploidy webinar series. He, uh, I added that last part, but um, um, but I really enjoyed the taxonomic breadth of this uh, uh, of this webinar series. It's been really interesting to hear about a variety of different systems. And um, uh, so I, I sincerely welcome any feedback that that those of you who work on very different systems might have uh, coming from different perspectives. So today, as uh, Mike mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, a group of fish, uh, in this case, uh, catastomids or suckers. Uh, that some of you might not be familiar with, but have undergone a whole genome duplication event uh, in their ancestor. Before I jump into that, I'll just do this uh, sort of quick review of some of the common themes of uh, polyploidy literature, some of which Kevin just uh, touched on quite nicely, but uh, just very briefly, this, this idea of genome shock following whole genome duplications, some of the things that can happen that lead to uh, instability uh, in some cases. I'll, I'll skip most of this because Kevin gave some nice examples, but um, uh, there's the shock part, but the part that I'm really interested in is the awe part, the, the process of rediploidization, how organisms uh, in some cases can uh, uh, undergo that process. So we're thinking about things like chromosomal rearrangements, how transcriptional networks are reset, sub and neo functionalization, fractionation, um, in some cases, interesting patterns of TEs, and uh, uh, and finally, subgenome dominance that Kevin uh, touched on so nicely. So thanks for that, uh, Kevin. Um, so these are the kind of things we're we're thinking about as we uh, as we consider the the group of fish that I'll talk about today. So this is a, a phylogeny of uh, sort of a vertebrates, but from a very through a very thick fish specific lens. I saw Ingo Brash is on the call today, so I have Gar on here, fortunately. Um, uh, but the, the, these organisms have undergone a series of whole genome duplication events. The two, the two whole genome duplications most uh, familiar or most uh, important to humans are the 1R and 2R. I think I have a UR here. 
sort of line. Um, <clears throat> these, these very old duplications in fish, the most, uh, probably the most famous is the 3R, or the teleos specific uh, duplication shared by maybe 20,000 teleos species. Um, and then a number of fish, fish lineages have undergone a specific fourth or per, per, perhaps subsequent round of whole genome duplications. One of the most famous is the salmon specific duplication in the ancestor of salmonids. Um, but also one I'll talk about today, which are the suckers or catastomids shown here, which have their own independent uh, whole genome duplication event uh, around 60 million years ago. So this one's less familiar to uh, many people, I suspect. Those of you who don't know suckers, these are, uh, this is a group of uh, a family of fishes with uh, quite a bit of diversity, maybe 80 or so species. They get their name because of these fleshy lips, the most important part of a sucker. Um, which help them feed off the bottom. And uh, these lips are so important, they're in fact actually a taxonomically uh, diagnostic feature for many species. So um, uh, we're, we're actually thinking about rebranding suckers, kind of a negative name. So there's gonna be a Twitter poll later on uh, new potential uh, common names for suckers. But there was a time when sucker polyploidy was a really hot topic in science. So science and nature papers were published 40 or so years ago on the existence of polyploidy in this uh, family. And even Ono himself uh, uh, thought a lot about cypriniform fishes, this group of minnows and suckers, uh, and the role of whole genome duplications. So this has been a, 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 an important group from understanding animal polyploidy. <clears throat> These early papers uh, in the absence of genome, uh, uh, genome sequences relied on allozyme loci. So this paper, for example, shows a bunch of different sucker species. Each column is an allozyme uh, locus, and the ones that are shaded are expressed in duplicate. So based on this uh, information, about 50% of allozyme loci are, uh, are duplicated. And, and these authors concluded that uh, suckers have whole genome duplication in their uh, ancestor. Uh, based on the fossil record about 60 million years ago. So very old whole genome duplication event. There's also a lack of tetrasomy based on karyotype uh, chromosome smears. So that's the state of knowledge 40 years ago, and, and we haven't gone much past that, except uh, recently we've been, uh, we've been able to sequence whole, genome, whole genomes of, uh, of suckers. Um, there are no, none published yet, but this is the first uh, that we've, we've started working on, which is razorback sucker, Sorauchin texanus. Uh, is a species of conservation concern. So there's a variety of reasons why we wanted to do this. Um, uh, but here, here's the uh, whole genome dupli the uh, genome assembly um, for this species that we've generated. So the circos plot on the left shows um, <clears throat> shows the 50 uh, chromosomes, haploid chromosome count. Uh, and what you'll notice is that a number of these are these are uh, colored by pairs. For example, chromosome five and nine here are share the same color, and the arcs actually represent homologous uh, 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 retained duplicated genes uh, arising from that whole genome duplication event. So what you can see is that if you look around uh, the genome, there's very nicely, very strongly conserved uh, duplicated homologous chromosomes still uh, uh, still nicely sorting out. Very few uh, chromosomal or gene-specific rearrangements have uh, occurred, like these that I'm pointing to. Okay, so you might think that that's a, you know, maybe it looks like a relatively recent duplication, but again, this is 60 million years uh, old. We can also look at the conservation of uh, of the karyotype by comparing with a diploid outgroup. In this case, zebrafish, which has diverged maybe 100 million or so years ago. Uh, and if we do that, if we take a given zebrafish chromosome, here are the 25 on the left, and follow it over, you see that every zebrafish chromosome uh, matches to two razorback sucker chromosomes, incredibly strongly conserved uh, karyotype over deep time. What about some other fish genome duplications that have been uh, published previously? Two of the famous ones are common carp and Atlantic salmon. Common carp is a cypriniform fish. It's a relatively close relative of, uh, of suckers. This whole genome duplication took place about 11 million years, and it has, again, the very strongly conserved syntony. 
so the homeologs are, are really easily identifiable in common carp. In contrast, in salmonids, you see a, a very different picture. An incredible number of uh, chromosomal rearrangements, things like Robertsonian uh, translocations uh, have occurred in the time since the duplication. Salmon duplication is more like 80 million years ago. So uh, a lot of people suggested that perhaps the difference between these is just simply more time has passed. Um, but in sequencing uh, razorback sucker, we now know that uh, time doesn't solely explain the difference in, uh, in the structure of these genomes. So razorback sucker is, is almost on the order of the same age as uh, Atlantic salmon, and yet we have this strongly conserved uh, karyotype. One thing that does differ between these genomes is the, uh, the actual type of polyploidy event. Salmon are thought uh, to be autopolyploid, uh, which may play some role in that, uh, whereas common carp is very strongly allopolyploid, as I'll show in a moment. Uh, in razorback sucker, the catastomids are also probably allopolyploid, but somewhat more ambiguously so. I'll show more on that in a, in a moment. So to, to look a little bit further at this idea of uh, uh, conservation of karyotype over time, we can look across the family just, just simply looking at chromosome counts, uh, not just the family, but the order, cyprinoformes, which are the, the, the suckers, but also minnows and carp, uh, as well as salmon and their diploid uh, relatives. One of the things that we see if we look in cyprinoformes, the diploid, the common diploid uh, chromosome number is 50. The vast majority of species have 50 chromosomes. These are dip diploids. Sometimes there's one or two fusions. Um, and then you can see in cases where there's tetraploids, they have almost exactly 75 chromosomes. If they have 100, they have tetraploid origins and 150 for hexaploids. Very little uh, wiggle room in terms of this uh, base number of 25 chromosomes duplicated in various ploidy levels. Okay, so lots of changes of, of ploidy in cyprinoformes. These are, there are many different independent examples of, of du uh, uh, duplications. In contrast, if you look at salmon uh, and their relatives, the diploid uh, chromosome numbers are either 22 or 50, depending on the, the diploid outgroup. And then you have these tetraploids, and there's lots of variation in the actual karyotype. These chromosomal rearrangements have led to changes in the karyotype uh, over time. So very different patterns in salmon versus, um, uh, versus suckers and, and minnows. All right, so we have this Tennyson quote, this, this idea of variation on the type in the case of cyprinoformes because of polyploidy, but with stable karyotype structure. Uh, but then in salmon, you have uh, a massive changes in karyotype. If anybody has ideas on mechanisms that drive this, I'm, I'm all ears. Um, get into some details about that uh, next. Next thing we want to do is try to understand this subgenome structure and what these two subgenomes are doing uh, in more detail. So uh, we started doing some phylogenomic analyses. And when I say we really, this is uh, Jesse Pelosi did a, a tremendous amount of work on this and with help from uh, Milton Tan, so uh, cheers to them. Um, but this is a time calibrated <clears throat> phylogeny of, um, uh, of suckers, but placed into the broader phylogenetic context. Uh, razorback sucker are two um, are pairs of duplicated genes show up here, Texanus A and B. Um, and they, they form uh, phylogenetically, uh, they, they fall out as sister to one another. Um, so this doesn't actually help us sort of phase these, uh, these different subgenomes phylogenetically. Uh, and the reason we thought it might was because this process worked in CARP. In CARP, they can take the two, um, the two subgenomes or duplicated genes and they fall out different in different locations on the phylogeny. So this oncostoma is sister to uh, depending on which species you use, is sister to one of the two subgenomes in CARP. Okay, so this is a very strongly uh, allopolyploid duplication, uh, but less so in, in suckers, or at least we don't have the right diploid uh, outgroup extant. <clears throat> uh, another thing we tried to, to sort of 
attempt to phase or pull apart these two subgenomes, assign chromosomes to different subgenomes, was by looking at single copy busco genes and asking the question of whether these are uh, disproportionately found on one subgenome versus the other. The reason we thought this might be the case is because this worked in carp, again, strongly allopolyploid carp, almost all of the single copy buscos are res restricted to just one uh, subgenome. Uh, this is not the case in suckers. In fact, all 50 chromosomes have some number of single copy busco genes, and there's no obvious bias across these. So each of these is a pair of homeologous chromosomes from the two different subgenomes. Okay, so that didn't tell the story. The next thing we tried was looking at TEs, and we looked at a bunch of different uh, types of TEs. This, this was some help. So here, DNA transposon content, again, for each of these homeologous pairs from two different subgenomes, um, there is a bias of having more DNA transposons in one subgenome versus another, but the difference is very slight. It's mostly consistent, but uh, very slight across these. If we go in and look at specific repeats, here's one example of uh, a, a repeat that's uh, very strongly biased to one subgenome, the purple lines here, uh, versus the other. It's not 100%, but there, is, there are a few repeats that are strongly biased, say 100-fold more common on one than the other. Okay, so now we sort of believe that we may have assigned the chromosomes correctly to, um, to subgenome, but, but rather weakly so. Another thing we looked at was uh, uh, expression divergence of uh, retained duplicates or onologs, however you prefer your terminology. Um, and one of the things we found was that uh, the vast majority of genes uh, across, these are 14 different tissues here, uh, expression of those genes on the y-axis, the vast majority of genes are expressed in uh, both uh, chromosomes. This is showing one particular pair of chromosomes, chromosome five and nine, but the same pattern holds throughout the genome. So most genes that are expressed are expressed on both homeologous chromosomes. Uh, that was a, a rather surprising to us. If you, if you squint, you can see there might be some bias consistent across. One chromosome seems to have a little bit stronger expression, but uh, those patterns are relatively weak. Okay, so there's true bipartisanship of these subgenomes. There's the expression on uh, both subgenomes. And there may be some scope for uh, potentially for subfunctionalization as well. So again, showing 14 different tissues here. These are for razorback sucker. Um, the y-axis here is the percentage of genes that are differentially expressed uh, from one analog to the next. So for example, 50% of genes uh, in each of these tissues are, are differentially expressed across onologs um, in a given tissue, if that makes sense. A little bit complicated, but um, basically there's a, this idea that you may have differential expression of genes, uh, of duplicated genes within a, a particular tissue. All right, so just checking the time. Um, so I think I'm, I'm relatively short on time, so I won't go into this, but we've expanded the phylogenetic sampling, not just to look at razorback sucker. This is a tree of the catastomidae, but we've also done, uh, we've sequenced the genome also of Mixocyprinus, which is an important group because it, it helps us encompass the entire crown of uh, diversity in, um, in the catastomids. Uh, and in fact, the patterns are quite similar across these very different taxa. Both subgenomes appear to be important and, and lots of genes are expressed and there seems to be some balance uh, between the two. Uh, but we've also filled in additional lineages and we're trying to do this uh, comparatively to try to see what are these patterns in a more uh, comparative genomic context. Uh, so stay tuned, more on that uh, soon. Just to do a quick summary, um, we see Remarkably stable genome structure over deep evolutionary time, 60 million years of having both of these uh, subgenomes uh, retain some level of function. This idea of genomic shock is, is not something we see a lot of evidence for. The karyotype seems to be conserved across cyproniform fishes other than changes in ploidy level. Um, no obvious bias in fractionation or uh, only very weak subgenome dominance. Uh, in contrast to a number of different species. 
Um, we do see some evidence of differential uh, expression, so sub or neo functionalization may be possible. Um, that's something we're looking at in more detail next with larger uh, sample sizes. Um, uh, the mechanisms governing this, other than the sort of dis distribution of labor of these two subgenomes, is, is not entirely clear. For example, um, given how slight the allopolyploidy is, if you call it allopolyploidy, why wasn't there a non-homologous recombination across? So that's something I'm really interested in is, is what are the dynamics that, uh, what are the mechanisms that prevent non-homologous non recombination? Uh, with that, I'll just say uh, thank you to uh, many people who are involved in this work uh, and, and presented, uh, provided analyses and uh, insight. Um, I want to thank in particular Tom Dowling, who's uh, uh, the father of razor, razorback sucker uh, genetics. Tom's worked on razorback sucker for 25 or, or so years and uh, has really shaped my thinking about sucker evolution. I just want to say thank you to him. Uh, and uh, we're looking for people. So if, uh, if anyone's looking for a postdoc position, please come join us and help us uh, publish this. Uh, thank you. All right, well, well, thank you, Trevor, for a really wonderful talk. Um, as always, we can put, folks can put their questions in the chat box uh, and uh, a few people turn on their audio and video to ask their questions. Um, I know it's fascinating. I, we, we've always been intrigued by this sort of slow motion diplomatization or whatever it is that's <laughs> and fractionation right that, that seems to happen in the fishes and, uh, yeah it's it's it'll be really cool to have the, all these genomes available um uh, to look at these analyses across this 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 particular event which seems like the you have a lot of diversity there to work with so yeah. So I have a real quick question, um, and then we'll get to the, the first one there. The um, well, I'm not familiar with the phylogeny of, the, of the, this clade. So how sort of the crown group that that all shares this this uh, tetraploidy, um, like what's the divergence among the you know the, the sort of species on the on the two ends of that? How far yeah. back does that crown group go to get close to that WG? Yeah, I think I have the phylogeny. Hopefully. Sure, that's this. This is a, a published phylogeny. Um, and uh, so that that divergence time, if you if you accept the timeline here, that's 63 million years divergence for those. So there's a very old group. Mixocyprinus is actually the only extant uh, uh, form found in Asia, which is the thought was that's where the origin of the group half uh, occurred. And then they made their way over to North America and then subsequently. Right, and so you don't have like a really long stem to the crown since that polyploidy, you've got pretty quickly the lineages that, the, so when you're sampling across that, you, you can sort of potentially really see, potentially really different histories that of, of genome evolution following the polyploidy. That's really cool. Yeah, exactly. That'll be a really then, great platform for testing hypotheses about this stuff, yeah. Yeah, so we get a, some sense of how quickly that those changes happen given that that timeline. Actually, we don't know when the duplication happened exactly prior to that. Um, uh, so how do you know beyond that is a little bit more difficult. But right. Um, but but we have representatives of most of the other lineages within North America as well. So we have a sense of the timeline to some extent. Uh, otherwise, excellent. All right, uh, Victor Albert, there has a question. Um, uh, the ones that pop on. I mean, we, we talk about this stuff a lot, Trevor, but I don't remember asking, uh, are these fish ever known to be clonal? And if not these guys, uh, uh, the uh, carp? Uh, not to my knowledge, not naturally so, at least, um, uh, as far as I know. Yeah, I haven't heard any of the examples. Um, other fishes, yes, definitely, but not not in these specifically. It just makes me wonder if they go through long clonal phases. Um, that could account for slowdown of fractionation and all that fun stuff. Yeah, not not clonality, but um, I I don't know if this is along the same lines. But there is extensive uh, reticulate evolution, introgression in uh, catastomids, and that was another thought was that maybe that slows down this process of in some ways, if it resets the clock. Um, 
uh, that's a little bit more yeah, uh, uh, speculative. But. And if I remember right, uh, these guys have a long fossil record as well, so you're even more sure of this duplication time. Right, the timeline, yeah, the timeline base is based in large part on the origin of these fossils, which I guess we don't 100% know for sure that they're uh, polyploid, but because of the existence of Mixocyprinus here, we're pretty sure that's that's a single whole genome duplication event. So it has to be at least that old, um, uh, just based on the structure of those two genomes. Good question. Cool. That looks like uh, the next question there is from uh, Misha. Mm -hmm. Hi. So yeah, really interesting talk is sort of a very like intriguing pairing with Kevin's talk. That you have all this homeologous exchange in one system and, and very little in another. Um, I was just curious, you were you were wondering about mechanism and how this could be happening. Have people looked very much at meiosis and like what sort of the proteins that we know are involved in pairing in other species? Has anyone looked at their dynamics in the system? Yeah, not with, not to my knowledge with, with modern tools. Um, the only thing, you know, people have done the, the, the karyotype, the chromosome smears, and just looked at patterns of pairing. And there's only ever been, uh, there's only evidence of uh, disomy uh, in these. There's mm -hmm. never, you don't ever see tetrasomic uh, pairing, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but we've just started to try to pull out some of those genes and uh, haven't gotten very far with that. But I think it's a really exciting uh, way to go. The other thing is we looked at um, high C plots, uh, high C contact plots to try to see if there's any kind of patchiness like um, uh, the recent wheat, wheat genome papers, for example, some of those yeah. where you see like uh, subgenomes in particular compartments. Um, but that there's nothing obvious like that either uh, in that case. So it was one thought was that the 3D architecture might relate to these things just um, being in different physical locations during meiosis. Good question. Thanks. All right. Uh, any other questions for Trevor? Uh, wait, actually, sorry, there is one uh, from, uh, looks like from uh, Joseph there. Uh, Joe, hey, you want to, there you go. I'll just jump on. <laughs> hey, uh, great talk, um, really interesting system. I was just wondering, you know, sort of generally, but maybe for some of your data where you did see subgenome dominance, um, how do you tell, how do you distinguish that from like, you know, if you're, original history was that you had an introgressant becoming a polyploid versus, you know, selection maintained the difference or some other, you know, you end up with differential fractionation or whatever, but how do you distinguish those two scenarios or, or does, do you see introgressants in these diploid populations? Uh, we see, um, yeah, so we see, we see hybridization and subsequent introgression, if, if, yeah. if that's a question. I actually have a picture of that too, I think. Uh, so here's an example of uh, hybrids between the two, uh, between two different uh, genera, actually. Um, and they, they do form these back crosses that then, well, th they form these hybrids that then back cross into the population. So you do get some of this uh, reticulate uh, evolution type. Um, evolution. Uh, so if you start out with a quarter of the genome of the other species, <laughs> how do how does that how do you tell that apart sixty million years later from fractionation? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know if I have a solid answer for that. Okay, just. Um, uh, one, one thing I'll say though is, uh, if I can find the slide, there is a lot of um, uh, discordance in the phylogeny, this early group. So there's a question of whether suckers are actually sister to minnows, the cy cyprinids or cyprinoids, uh, versus loaches, another group. Uh, and actually, uh, the gene trees show about a 50-50 mix between those two. 
Um, so that uh, it's a difficult problem phylogenetically. I'm not sure it could just be no. the, that they're in the anomaly zone, but um, but it's also possible that uh, that that was a, some sign of the the initial hybridization event that perhaps led to that. I don't know if that answers your question. I think it does. No, I just think it's a, a difficult problem. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, um, are there any, any any other questions for either Trevor or Kevin today? All right. Well, um, th that was a really uh, great set of talks from both of you, and I uh, uh, appreciate both of you taking the time to to speak to us today. Um, and, and again, uh, in two weeks, uh, where we will uh, have two more talks on polyploidy. Uh, and, and on March 15th, we'll hear from uh, Magdalena, Magdalena Bohutinska, who will tell us about genomic novelty and process level convergence and adaptation to whole genome duplication, as well as Merrick Glombic, who will talk about homolog homeolo specific gene expression and reciprocal plant hybrids. Um, and with that, uh, just a final thank you to everybody today, and we'll see everyone again in two weeks. All right. Bye, folks. <laughs>